At Gaius Points by Aaron Dembski Bowden The Memory of Fire Fire and falling, incineration and annihilation, and darkness, absolute silence, absolute nothing. I opened my eyes, there before me, outlined by scrolling white text across my targeting display, is a shattered metal wall. Its architecture is gothic in nature, a skeletal wall, with black steel girders like ribs form the wall's curvature. It is mangled and bent, crushed even. I do not know where I am, but my senses are awash with perception. I hear the crackle of fire-eating metal, and the angry hum of live battle armour. The sound is distorted, a hitch or a burr in the usually steady thrum. Damage has been sustained. My armour is compromised. A glance at the biofeed display shows minor damage to the armour plating of my wrist and shin. Nothing serious. I smell the flames nearby, and the bitter rancidity of melting steel. I smell my own body, the sweat, the chemicals injecting into my flesh by my armour, and the intoxicatingly rich scent of my own blood. A god's blood. Refined and thinned, for use in mortal veins, but a god's blood, nevertheless. A dead god. A slain angel. The thought brings my teeth together in a grunted curse, my fangs scraping the teeth below. Enough of this weakness. I rise, muscles of aching flesh bunching in unison with fibre-bundled false muscles of my armour. It is a sensation I am familiar with, yet it somehow feels flawed. I should be stronger. I should exult in my strength, the ultimate fusion of biological potency and machine power. I do not feel strong. I feel nothing but pain and a momentary disorientation. The pain is centralised in my spinal column and shoulder blades, turning my back into a pillar of dull, aching heat. Nothing is broken. Biofeeds have already confirmed that. The soreness of muscle and nerve would have killed a human, but we are gene-forged into greater beings. Already, the weakness fades. My blood stings with the flood of adrenaline stimulants and kinetic enhancement narcotics rushing through my veins. My movement is unimpeded. I rise to my feet. Slow, not for weakness now, but for caution. With my vision stained a cooling emerald shade by my helm's green eye lenses, I take in the wreckage around me. This chamber is ruined, half crushed with its walls distorted, Restraint thrones lie broken, torn from the floor. The two bulkheads leading from the chamber are both wrenched from their hinges, hanging at warped angles. The impact must have been savage. The impact. The crash. Our thunderhawk crashed. The clarity of recollection is sickening. The sense of falling from the sky. My sense is drenched in the thunder of descent. The shaking of the ship in its entirety. Temperature gauges on my retinal display rose slightly when the engines died in exploding flares that scorched the hull, and my armour systems registered the gunship's fiery journey groundward. There was a final, booming refrain, a roar like the carnosaurs of home, as loud and primal as the Predator King's challenge. And the world shuddered beyond all sanity. The gunship ploughed into the ground. And then... Darkness. My eyes flicker to my retinal display's chronometer. I was unconscious for almost three minutes. I will do penitence for such weakness. But that can come later. Now I breathe in deep, tasting the ashy smoke in the air, but unaffected by it. The air filtration in my helm's grill renders me immune to such trivial concerns. Zabian! A voice crackles in my ear. A momentary confusion takes hold at the sound of the word. The Vox signal is either weak, or the sender's armour is badly damaged. With the ship in pieces, both could be true. Zavian, the voice says again. This time I turn at the name, realising it is my own. Zavian strode into the cockpit, keeping his balance on the tilted floor through an effortless combination of natural grace and his armour's joint stabilisers. The cockpit had suffered even more than the adjacent chamber. The view window, 
despite the thickness of the reinforced plastic, was shattered beyond simple repair. Diamond shards of the sundered false glass twinkled on the twisted floor. The pilot thrones were wrenched from their support columns, cast aside like detritus in a storm. Through the windowless viewport, there was nothing but mud and gnarled black roots, much of which had spilled over the lifeless control consoles. They'd come down hard enough to drive the gunship's nose into the earth. The pilot, Valen, was a mangled wreck sprawled face down over the control console. Xavian's targeting reticule locked onto his brother's battered armour, secondary cursors detailing the rents and wounds in the deactivated warplate. Blood, thick and dark, ran from rips in Varlan's throat and waist joints. It ran in slow trickles across the smashed consoles, dripping between buttons and levers. His power pack was inactive, life signs were unreadable, but the evidence was clear enough. Xavian heard no heartbeat from the body, and had Valen been alive, his gene-enhanced physiology would have clotted and sealed all but the most grievous wounds. He wouldn't still be bleeding slowly all over the controls of the downed gunship. Xavian, said a voice to the right, no longer over the vox. Xavian turned from Valen, his armour snarling in a growl of joint servos. There, pinned under wreckage from the collapsed war, was Dryas. Zavian moved to the fallen warrior's side, seeing the truth. No, Dryas was not just pinned in place. He was impaled there. The sergeant's black helm was lowered, chin down on his collar, green eyes regarding the broken imperial eagle on his chest, jagged wreckage knifed into his dark armour, the ravaged steel spearing him through the shoulder guard, the arm, the thigh, and the stomach. Blood leaked through his helm speaker grill. The biometric displays that flashed up on Xavian's visor told an ugly story, and one with an end soon to come. Report, Sergeant Dreyer said, the way he always said it, as if the scene around him were the most mundane situation imaginable. Xavian kneeled by the pinned warrior, fighting back the aching need in his throat and gums to taste the blood of the fallen. Irregular and weak, a single heartbeat rattled in Dreyas's chest. One of his hearts had shut down, likely flooded by internal hemorrhaging or burst by the wreckage, piercing his body. The other pounded gamely, utterly without rhythm. Valon is dead, Zavian said. I can see that, fool. The sergeant reached up one hand, the one not half severed at the forearm and clawed with unmoving fingers at the collar joint beneath his helm. Xavian reached to help, unlocking the helmet's pressurised seals with a reptilian hiss, and the helmet came free in Xavian's hands. Dreyas's craggy face, ruined by the pits and scars earned in two centuries of battle, was awash in spatters of blood. He grinned, showing blood-pink teeth and split gums. My helm display is damaged. Tell me who is still alive. Zavian could see why it was damaged. Both eye lenses were cracked. He discarded the sergeant's helm, and Blink clicked the runic icon that brought up the rest of the squad's life signs on his own in retinal display. Valen was dead. His suit powered down. The evidence of that was right before Zavian's eyes. Garrix was also gone, his suit transmitting a screed of flatline charts. The rangefinder listed him as no more than twenty metres away, likely thrown clear in the crash and killed on impact. Dryas was dying right here. Jarl was... Where's Jarl? Zavian asked, his voice harsh and guttural through his helm as Vox speaker. He's loose. Dryas sucked in a breath through clenched teeth. His armour's failing systems were feeding anaesthetic narcotics into his blood, but the wounds were savage and fatal. My rangefinder lists him as a kilometre distant. Even with its unreliability compared to a tracking orspex, it was a decent enough figure to trust. The sergeant's good hand clenched Zavian's wrist, and he glared into his brother's eye lenses with a fierce bloodshot stare. Find him! Whatever it takes, Zavian! Bring him in! Even if you have to kill him, it will be done. After! You must come back. After. Dryas spat onto his own chest, 
marking the broken Imperial Eagle with his lifeblood. Come back, for our gene seed. Xavier nodded, rising to his feet, feeling his fingers curl in the need to draw weapons. He stalked from the cockpit without a backward glance at the sergeant. He would never see alive. Again. Jarl had awoken first. In fact, it was truer to say that Jarl had simply not lost his grip on consciousness in the impact, for his restraints bound him with greater security than the standard troop thrones. In the shaking thunder of the crash, he had seen Garrix hurled from the torn space where a wall had been a moment before. He had heard the vicious wet snap of destroyed vertebrae and ruined bone as Garrix had crashed into the edge of the hole on the way out, and he had seen Xavian thrown from his restraint throne to smash sidelong into the cockpit bulkhead, sliding to the floor, unconscious. Enveloped in a force cage around his own restraint throne, Jarl had seen these things occurring through the milky shimmer screen of electrical force, yet he had been protected against the worst of the crash. Ah, but that protection had not lasted for long. With the gunship motionless, with his brothers silent, and the Thunderhawk around him creaking and burning in the chasm it had carved in the ground, Jarl tore off the last buckles and scrambled over the wreckage of what had been his power-fielded throne. The machine itself, its generator smoking, reeked of captivity. Jarl wanted to be far from it. He glanced at Xavian, stole the closest weapons he could find in the chaos of the crash site, and ran out into the jungle. He had a duty to fulfill. A duty to the Emperor, his father. Zabian's blade and bolter were gone. Without compunction, he took Dreas's weapons from the small arming chamber behind the transport room, handling the relics with none of the care he would otherwise have used. Time was of the essence. The necessary theft complete, he climbed from the wreckage of the gunship, vaulting down to the ground and leaving the broken hull behind. In one hand was an idling chain axe, the motors within the haft, chuckling darkly in readiness to be triggered into roaring life. In the other, a bolt pistol, its blackened surface, detailed with the crude scratchings of a hundred and more kill runes. Xavian didn't look at the smoking corpse of his gunship in some poignant reverie. He knew he would be back to gather the gene seed of the fallen, if he survived this hunt. There was no time for sentiment. Yar was loose. Xavian broke into a run, his armor's joints growling at the rapid movement as he sprinted after his wayward brother, deep into the jungles of Armageddon. They call it Armageddon. Maybe so. There is nothing to love about this planet. Whatever savage beauty it once displayed is long dead now, choked under the relentless outflow of the sky-choking factories that vomit black smog into the heavens. The skies themselves are ugly enough, a greyish-yellow shroud of weak poison embracing the strangled world below. It does not rain water here. It rains acid, as thin, weak, and strangely pungent as a reptile's kiss. Who could dwell here, in such impurity? The air tastes of sulphur and machine oil. The sky is the colour of infection. The humans, the very souls we are fighting to save, are dead-eyed creatures without passion or life. I do not understand them. They embrace their enslavement. They accept their confinement within towering manufactories, filled with howling machines. Perhaps it is because they have never known freedom. But that is no true excuse to act as brain-killed as a servitor. We fight for these souls because we are told it is our duty. We are dying, selling our lives in the greatest war this world has ever known, to save them from their own weakness and allow them to return to their lightless lives. The jungle here. We have jungles on my home world, yet not like this. The jungles of home are saturated with life. Parasites thrive in every pool of dark water. Insects hollow out the greatest trees to build their chittering poisonous hives. The air 
already swarming with stinging flies, is sour with the reptilian stench of danger, and the ground will shake with the stalking hunts of the lizard predator kings. Surviving is the greatest triumph one can earn on Cretacea. The jungles here barely deserve the name. The ground is clinging mud, leaving you knee-deep in sulfuric sludge. What ragged life breathes the unclean air is weak, irritating and nothing compared to the threats of home. Of course, the jungles here possess a danger not even remotely native to the planet itself. They swarm with the worst kind of vermin. With the planet locked in the throes of invasion, I am all too aware of what brought down our Thunderhawk. A pack of them hunt up ahead. As soon as he heard their piggish snarls and barking laughter, Jarl's tongue ached with a raw, coppery urgency. His teeth itched in their sockets, and he felt his heartbeat in the soft tissue around his incisors. His splashing sprint through the jungle became a hunched and feral stride, while the chain blade in his grip growled each time he gunned the trigger. Small arms fire rattled in his direction, even before he cleared the line of trees. They knew he was coming. He made sure of that. Jarl ignored the metallic rainfall of solid rounds clanging from his warplate. The trees parted and revealed his prey. Six of them hunkered around a tank made of scavenged, rusted scrap. Greenskins, their fat-mouthed pistols crashing loud and discordant, their brutish features illuminated by the flickering of muzzle flashes. Jarl saw none of this. His vision... Filtered through targeting reticules, saw only what his dying mind projected. A far greater enemy. The ancient slaves of the ruinous powers feasting on the bodies of the loyal fallen. Where Jarl ran, the skies were not the milky yellow of pus, but the deep blue nightfall on ancient terror. He did not splash through black-watered marshland. He strode across the battlements of gold while the world ended around him in a storm of heretical fire. Jarl charged, his scream rendered harsh and deafening by his helm's vocalizers. The chainsword's throaty roar reached an apex in the moment before it was brought down onto the shoulder of the first orc. The killing fury brought darkness again, but the blackness now was awash with blessed Sacred red. Zavian heard the slaughter. His pace, already at a breakneck sprint, through the vegetation intensified tenfold. If he could catch Jarl, catch him before his brother made it to Imperial lines, he would avert a catastrophe of innocent blood and the blackest shame. His red and black warplate, the dark red of arterial blood, the black of the void between worlds, was a ruined mess of burn markings, silver gougings where damage and the crash had scored away the paint from the ceramite surface and mud spattered filth as he raced through the swamp. Yet when one carries the pride of a chapter on one's shoulder, necessity lends strength to aching limbs and the false muscles of broken armour. Zavian burst into the clearing where his brother was embattled. His trigger fingers clenched at once one unleashing a torrent of bolter shells at his brother's back, the other gunning the chain axe into whirling, lethal life. Yarl! Treachery. What madness is this, to be struck down by one's own sons? Sanguinius, the angel of blood, turns from the twisted demons he had slain and dismembered. One of his own sons screams his name, charging across the golden battlements while the heavens above them burn. The Primarch cries out, as his son's weapon speaks in anger. Bolt shells crack against his magnificent armour. His own son, one of his beloved blood angels, is trying to kill him. This cannot happen. And in that moment, Sanguinius decides it is not. There is heresy at work here, not disloyalty. Blasphemy, not naked betrayal. What foulness grips you! The angel cries at his false son. What perversion blackens the soul of a blood angel and warps him to serve the arch enemy? 
Sanguinius! The traitor son screams. Father! Zavin roared Jarl's name again, not knowing what his brother truly heard. The cries that returned from his brother's vox amplifiers chilled his blood. A bellowed, clashing litany of archaic high gothic and the tongue of Baal that Jarl had never learned. Surrounded by the ravaged bodies of dead greenskins, the two brothers came together. Zavian's first blow was blocked, the flat of Jarl's chain blade clashing against the haft of his axe. Jarl's armour was pitted and cracked, with smoking holes from the impact of bolt shells, yet his strength was unbelievable. Laughing in a voice barely his own, he hurled Zavian backwards. Unbalanced by his brother's insane vigour, Zavian fell back, rolling into a fighting crouch, shin deep in marsh water. Again, Jarl shouted in his unnerving, ancient diction, words Zavian recognised but did not understand. As with Jarl, he had never learned Balian, and never studied the form of High Gothic spoken ten thousand years before. Let this not be your end, my son. Join me. We will take the fight to Horus and drown his evil ambitions in the blood of his tainted warriors. Sanguinius removes his helm, a sign of honour and trust, despite the war raging around them, and smiles beneficently at his wayward son. His benevolence is legendary, his honour without question. It need not be this way. The angel of blood says through his princely smile. Join me to my father's side for the emperor. Zavian stared at his brother, barely recognising Yar's face in the drooling slack-jawed grin that met his gaze. His brother's features were red, a shining wetness from eyes that cried blood. A meaningless screed of syllables hammered from Yar's bleeding mouth. It sounded like he was choking on his own demented laughter. Brother, Zavian spoke softly, you are gone from us all. He rose to his feet, casting aside the empty bolt pistol. In his red gauntlets, he clutched the chain axe two-handed and stared at the brother he no longer knew. I am not your son, Jarl. I am no longer your brother. I am Zavian, of the Flesh Terrors. Born of Cretacea, and I will be your death if you will not let me be your salvation. Jarl heaved a burbling laugh, bringing bloody froth to his lips as he wheezed in a language he shouldn't know. You disgrace my bloodline, the angel said with infinite sorrow, his godlike heart breaking at the blasphemy before his eyes. The ultimate gate calls to me. A thousand of your masters will fall by my blade before they gain entrance to the Emperor's throne room. I have no more patience for your pulling heresy. Come, traitor. Time to die. Sanguinius unfurled his great white wings, pearlescent and sunlit bright in the firestorm wreathing the battlements. With tears in his eyes, tears of misery at the betrayal of one of his own sons, he launched forward to end this blasphemy once and for all. And I realise I cannot beat him. When we are shaped into what we are, when we are denied our humanity to become weapons of war, it is said that fear is purged from our physical forms and triumph is bred into our bones. This is an expression, an attempt at the kind of crude verse forever attributed to the warrior preachers of the Adeptus Astartes. It is true that defeat is anathema to us, but I cannot beat him. He is not the warrior I trained with for decades, nor the brother whose every move I can anticipate. His chain blade, still wet with green gore, arcs down. I block, barely, and I'm already skidding back in the sulfuric mud. His strength is immense. I know why this is. I am aware of the... the genetic truths at play. His mind cannot contain his delusional fury. He is using everything he has. Everything. Powering his muscles with more force and expending more energy than a functioning mind can allow. I can smell the alkaline reek of his blood through the damage in his armour. Combat narcotics are flooding his system in lethal quantities. 
In his madness, he cannot stem the flood of battle narcotics fusing with his bloodstream. His strength, his godly power, will kill him, but not quickly enough. A second deflected slice, a third and a fourth, that crashes against my helm. A blocked headbutt that crunches into my bracer and dulls my arm. A kick that hammers into my chest plate, even as I lean aside to dodge. A thunderclap. My vision spins, fire in my spine. I think my back is broken. I try to say his name, but it comes out as a scream. Rage. Black and wholesome, its tendrils bearing the purest intent, creeps in at the edge of my vision. I hear him laughing, and damning me in a language he shouldn't know. Then I hear nothing, except the wind. Sanguinius lifts the traitor with contemptuous ease. Held above his head, the blasphemer thrashes and writhes. The angel of blood stalks to the edge of the golden battlements, laughing and weeping all at once at the carnage below. It is a tragedy, but it is also beautiful. Mankind using its greatest might and achievements as it attempts to engineer its own demise. Titans, jewel in their hundreds, with millions of men dying around their iron feet. The sky is on fire. The entire world smells of blood. Die! The angel curses his treacherous son with a beauteous whisper, and hurls him from the battlements of the Imperial Palace into the maelstrom of war hundreds of meters below. Freed of his burden, and his bloodline's honor restored, the angel in gold makes haste away. His duty is not yet done. Consciousness returned with the first impact. A jarring crunch of armour against rock jolted Zavian from his lapse into the murky haze of near unconsciousness. Feeling himself crashing down the cliffside, he hammered his hand down hard into the rock, a claw of ceramite clutching at the stone. The Astartes grunted as his arm snapped straight, taking his weight, arresting his tumbling fall. Damage runes flickered up on his retinal display, a language of harsh white urgency. Zavian ignored them, though it was harder to ignore the pain throughout his body. Even the injected chemical anaesthetic compounds from his armour and the nerve-dulling surgery done to him couldn't entirely wash it away. That was a bad sign. He clawed his way back up the cliff, teeth clenched, gauntlets tearing handholds into the stone where nature hadn't provided any. Once at the top, the flesh terror retrieved the chain axe that had flown from his grip and broke into a staggering run. He almost killed me. That is a hard truth to swallow, for we are evenly matched for all of our lives. My armour is damaged, operating at half capacity, but it still lends me strength as I run. Behind me, the wrecked green tank remains alone, its crew slain, the rest of its missiles aiming into the sky with no one to fire them. Curse those piggish wretches for bringing down our gunship. I run on, gathering speed, slowing only to hack, hanging vegetation from my path. I recall the topography of this region from the hololithic maps at the last war council. The mining town of Dryfield is to the east. Jarl's rage-addled mind will drive him to seek out life. I know where he is going. I also know that unless someone slows him down, he will get there first. Sister Amelie Devorin kissed the bronze likeness of Saint Silvana and let the necklace icon fall back on its leather cord. The weak midday sun, while brightness penetrated the gauzy, polluted cloud cover, was a dull presence in the heavens only occasionally reflecting glare off the edges of Promethea, the squad's immolator tank. Her own armour was once silver, now stained a faint, dull grey from exposure to the filthy air of this world. She licked her cracked lips, resisting the desire to drink from the water canteen inside the tank. Second prayer was only an hour before, and she'd slacked her first with a mouthful of the brackish water, warmed as it was by the tank's idling engine. Sister, 
called down Briala from the Immolator's turret. Do you see that? Amalaya and Briala were alone while the rest of the squad patrolled the edges of the jungle. Their tank idled on the dirt road, with Amelie circling the hull, bolter in hand, and Briella panning her heavy flamers along the tree lines. Amelie whispered a litany of abasement before duty, chastising herself for letting her mind wander to thoughts of sustenance. Her bolter up and ready, she moved around to the front of the immolator. I saw nothing, she said. Eyes narrowed and focused. What was it? There was a tone colouring Briella's voice. On the final words, a suggestion of disapproval. Amelie's laxity had been noticed. I see nothing, she spoke again. There's... No. Wait. There. The something broke from its crouch in the vegetation at the tree line. A blur of crimson and black with a chain blade revving. Amelie recognised an Astartes instantly, and the threat a moment later. Her bolter barked once, twice, and dropped from her hands to clatter to the dirt. The gun crashed once more from its vantage point on the ground. A loud boom that hammered a shell from the tank's sloped armour plating. Even as this last shot was fired, Amelie's head flew clear off her shoulders. White hair, catching the wind before the bleeding wreckage rolled into the undergrowth. Braille blasphemed as she brought the flamatory round on protesting mechanics and wrenched the handles to aim the cannons low. The Astartes was cradling Amelie's headless body, speaking to it in a low snarl. Her sister was already dead. Briella squeezed both triggers. Twin gouts of stinking chemical flame roared from the cannons, bathing Amelie and the Astartes in clinging, corrosive fire. She was barely whispering a lament for her fallen sister, even as she blistered the armour and skin from Amelie's bones. It was impossible to see through the reeking orange miasma. Briella killed the jets of flame after seven heartbeats, knowing whatever had been washed in the fire would be annihilated, purged in the burning storm. Amelie, her armour blackened, its joints melted, her hands reduced to blackened bone. She lay on the ground, incinerated. A loud thud clanged on the tank's roof behind Briella. She turned in a restraint throne, the slower turret cycling round to follow her gaze. Already, she was trying to scramble free of her seat. The Astartes was burning. Holy fire licked at the edges of his warplate, and his joints steamed. He eclipsed the sun, casting a flickering shadow over her. His armour was black, charred, but not immolated. As she hauled herself out of her restraints, he levelled a dripping chainsword at her face. Flesh terrors! She screamed into the vox mic built into her armour's collar. Echoes of Gaius Point! In anciently accented Gothic, her killer said six whispered words. You will pay for your heresy. I watched from the shadows of the trees. The sororitas are tense, while one of them performs funerary rites over the destroyed bodies of their sisters. Three others stalk around the hull of their grey tank, bolters aimed while they stare into the jungle through gun sights. I can smell the corpses beneath the white shrouds. One is burned, cooked by Promethium chemical fire. The other had bled a great deal before she died, torn to pieces. I do not need to see the remains to know this is true, for now I hide, crouched and hidden. The jungle masks the ever-present charged hum of my armour from their weak, mortal ears, while I listen to fragments of their speech. Jarl's trail has grown cold, even the smell of his potent blood, lost in the billion scents of this sulphuric jungle. I need focus. I need direction. But as soon as I draw near enough to see the sisters' steel-grey armour and the insignias of loyalty they each wear, I curse my fortune. The Order of the Argent Shroud. They were with us at Gaius Point. 
Echoes of that battle will haunt us until the chapter's final nights. My Orsbeck senses something, I hear one of them say to her sisters. I am ready to move again, to taste shame and flee. I cannot confront them like this. They must not know of our presence. Something alive, she says, and with a power signature. Flesh terror, one of the sisters calls out, and my blood freezes in my veins. It is not fear I feel, but true sickening dread, as she uses our chapter's sacred name. How can they know? Flesh terror, show yourself. Face the Emperor's judgment for the barbarity of your tainted chapter. My teeth clench. My fingers quiver, then grip the chain axe tighter. They know. They know where Flesh Terror did this. Their wretched slain sisters must have warned them. Another female voice, the one carrying the Orspex scanner, adds to the first one's cries. We were at Gaia's point, decadent filth. Face us, and face retribution for your heresy. They know what happened at Gaius Point. They saw our shame, our curse, and the blood that ran that day. They believe I butchered two of their sisters here, and now lay the sins of my brother Jarl upon my shoulders. Gunfire rings out. A bolter shell slices past my pauldron, shredding vegetation. I see him, a female voice declares. There! A trigger finger strokes the engaged rune on the chain axe's haft. After a heartbeat's hesitation, I squeeze. Jagged, whirring teeth cycle into furious life. The weapon cuts air in anticipation of the moment it will eat flesh. They dare blame me for this. They open fire. I am not a heretic. But this must end. Zavian reached Dryfield, just as the sun was setting. He had left the jungle behind three hours before. The lone warrior's run came to an end at the fortified walls. Outside the mining settlement, he heard no sound from within, only the desperate howl of the wind across the wasteland. Hailing the walls, calling for centuries earned him no response. The settlement's gates were sealed, a jury-rigged amalgamation of steel bars, flatboard and even furniture, piled high behind the double doors, in the wall ringing the village. These pitiful defences were the colony's attempts to reinforce their walls against the ore cords sweeping across the planet. With neither the time nor the inclination to hammer the gates open through force, Zavian maglocked his axe to his back, and punched handholds in the metal wall itself, dragging himself to the ramparts fifteen metres above. The village was a collection of one-storey buildings, perhaps enough to house fifteen families. A dirt track cut through the village's centre like an old scar, evidence of the supply convoys that made it this far out from the main hives, and the passage of ore haulers who came to profit from the local copper mine. Low-quality metal would be in great demand by the planet's impoverished citizens, who could afford no better. The largest building, indeed the only one that was more than a hut made from scrap, was a spired church bedecked in crudely carved gargoyles. Zavian acknowledged all of this in a heartbeat span. The Astarte scanned the ramshackle battlements around the village, then turned to stare at the settlement itself. No sign of movement. He walked from the platform, falling the fifteen metres to the ground, and landing in a balanced crouch. He came across the first body less than a minute later. A woman, unarmed, slumped against the wall of a hovel, blood smear decorating the wall behind her. She was carved in half, and not cleanly. The wide streets between the ramshackle huts and homes were decorated with trails of blood, and the tracks of weight dragged through the dirt. All of these led to the same place. Whomever had come here and slain the colonists had dragged the bodies to the modest church with its shattered windows and corroded walls of flatboard and red iron. Zavian's retinal locketer display was finally picking up faint returns from Jarl's warplate. His brother was inside, 
no longer running, and from the silence, no longer killing. The flesh terror stalked past the weaponless corpse, limp in its lifeless repose, slain by his own sword in his brother's hands. Zavian had seen such things before. They were images he would never forget while he still drew breath. He felt cold, clinging shame run through his blood like a toxin. Just like at Gaius Point. It wasn't supposed to happen at Gaius Point. It was never supposed to happen. That night, they had damned themselves forever. It should have been a triumph worthy of being etched onto the armour of every warrior that fought there. The Imperial front line had held, but the Point Militia and the Order of the Argent Shroud, who had rallied the people of the wasteland town into an armed fighting force and raised the morale to fever pitch through their sermons and blessings in the name of the God Emperor. The Greenskins descended in a swarm of thousands, hurling themselves at the town's barricades, their mass forming a sea of bellowing challenges, leathery flesh and hacking blades. At the battle's apex, the sisters and the militia were on the edge of being overwhelmed. At last, and when it mattered most, Gaius Point's frantic distress calls were answered. They came in Thunderhawks, boosters howling as they soared over the embattled horde. The gunships kissed the scorched earth, only long enough to deploy their forces, almost two hundred Astartes, in armour of arterial red and charcoal black. The rattling roar of so many chain blades came together in a ragged, ear-splitting chorus, sounding like the war cry of a mechanical god. Zavian was in the first wave, alongside Jarl and his brothers. He hewed left and right, his blades grinding teeth, chewing through armour and bloody fungal flesh as the sons of Sanguinius reaped the aliens' lives. The orcs were butchered in droves, caught between the hammer and anvil, being annihilated from behind and gunned down from the front. Zavian saw nothing but blood, Xenos blood, stinking and thick, splashing across his helm. The smell of triumph, the reek of exultant victory. He was also one of the first to the barricades. By then, he couldn't see. He couldn't think. His senses were flooded by stimuli. All of it aching, enticing and maddening. He tried to speak, but it tore from his lips as a cry aimed at the polluted skies. Even breathing did nothing but draw the rich scent of alien blood deeper into his body, disseminating it through his system. To be so... Saturated by Zeno's taint, ignited a fire in his mind, tapping into the gene-deep fury that forever threatened to overwhelm him. Driven on by the ceaseless urge to drown his senses in the purity of enemy blood, Zavian disemboweled the last orc before him and vaulted the barricade. He had to kill. He had to kill! He was born for nothing else! He and his brothers had been fighting in furious hand-to-hand battle for two hours. The enemy was destroyed. The joyous cheers of the militia died in thousands of throats as, in a wave of vox screams and howling chainswords, half of the flesh terrors broke the barricades and ran into the town. With no foes to slay, the Astartes turned their rage upon whatever still lived. The angel mourned the slain. Their deaths were a dark necessity on the path to redemption. The prayers he chanted to the ceiling of the Emperor's throne room inspired tears in his eyes, and tears in the eyes of the thousands of loyal soldiers staring on. We must burn the slain, he whispered, through silver tears. We must forever remember those who died this day and remember the foulness that turned their hearts against us. Sanguinius! A voice cried from behind. It echoed throughout the chamber, where a million banners hung in the breezeless air, marking every regiment ever sworn to fight and die for the young Imperium of Man. The angel tilted his head, the very image of patient purity. I thought 
I killed you. Heretic. Y'all! Wheezing and mumbling with bloody saliva running in strings from his damaged mouth grill, Jarl staggered around to face his brother. What burbled from his mouth was a mixture of languages, wet with the blood in his throat. The chemical reek of Jarl's body assaulted Zavian's senses, even over the smell of his brother's burned armour and the reek of the slain. The combat narcotics flooding Jarl's body were eating him alive. Zavian did nothing but stare for several moments after he called his brother's name. The dead were everywhere, piled all across the floor of the church, a slumbering congregation of the slaughtered, perhaps a hundred of them, all dragged here after the carnage. Perhaps many of them had been found here in worshipful service, and only half the village had needed to be dragged. Trails of streaked, smeared blood marked the floor. Burn the bodies, Yar said, in grunted quotation, the tongue of their shared homeworld, amongst the screed of words Zavian couldn't make out. Purge the sin! Burn the bodies! Cleanse the palace! Zavian raised his chain axe. In sickening mirror image, his blood-maddened brother raised his dripping chainsword. This ends now, Yarl. There was a bark of syllables a drooling mess of annihilated words. The angel raised his golden blade. He had been so foolish. This was no mere heretic. Had he been blinded all along? Yes. The machinations of the tainted traitors had shrouded his golden eyes from the truth. But now, now he saw everything. Yes, Horus, he said with a smile that spoke of infinite rage. It ends now. The brothers met in the defiled church, their boots struggling to grip the mosaic-laid floor, awash as it was with innocent blood. The whining roar of chain blades was punctured by crashes as the weapons met. Jagged teeth shattered with every block and parry, clattering against nearby wooden pews as they were torn from their sockets. Zavian's blood hammered through his body, tingling with the electric edge of combat stimulants. Jarl was a shadow of the warrior he had been, frothing at the mouth, raving at allies that didn't exist, and half crippled by the lethal battle drugs overdose that was burning out his organs. Zavian blocked his brother's frantic, shaking cuts. Every time his axe fell, he'd carve another chasm into Jarl's armour. Ultimately, only one warrior was aware enough to know this would never be settled by chain blades. With a last block and a savage return, Zavian smashed Jarl's blade aside and kicked it from his grip. Its engine stuttered to a halt, resting on the tilted ground. Jarl watched it fly from his grip with delayed, bleeding vision. Before he could recover, Zavian's hands were at his throat. The flesh terror squeezed, his hands crunching into Jarl's neck, collapsing the softer joint armour there and vicing into the flesh beneath. Jarl fell to his knees as his brother strangled him. His gene-enhanced physiology was poisoned by both the curse and the narcotics, and his sight began to darken as his body could take no more punishment. Darken, yet clear. Deprived of air, Unable to even draw a shred of breath, he mouthed a voiceless word that never left the confines of his charred helm. Zavian. Zavian wrenched his grip to the side, snapping the bones of his brother's spine and still strangling. He stood like this for some time. Night had fallen before the warrior's gauntlets released their burden and Jarl's body finally slumped to the ground. There... The madman rested, asleep among those he had slain. It is done, Zavin spoke into the squad's vox channel, his eyes closed as only silence replied. Jarl is dead, brothers. It is done. He chose to finish what his brother had begun. Even in madness, there sometimes hides a little sense. The bodies had to be burned, not to purify any imagined heresy, but to hide the evidence of what had happened here. It was never supposed to happen. 
Here, or at Gaius Point, they had damned themselves, and all that remained was to fight as loyally as they could before righteous vengeance caught up with them all. As the church burned, pouring thick black smoke into the polluted sky, the sound of engines grumbled from the horizon. Orcs. The enemy was finally here. Zabian stood among the flames, immune to them, his axe in his hand. The fire would draw the aliens closer. There was no way he could defend the whole village against them, but the thought of shedding and tasting their blood before he finally fell ignited his killing urge. His fangs ached as the vehicles pulled in to a halt outside. No. Those engines were too clean, too well maintained. It was the enemy, but it was not the greenskins. I walk from the church, the broken axe in my hand. There are twenty of them, in human unison. Impressive enough, even if it lacks the perfection of Astarte's unity. They raise their bolters. The sisters of the Order of the Argent Shroud. The silver hulls of their tanks and their own armour are turned a flickering orange-red in the light of the fire that should have hidden our sins. Twenty guns aim at me. The thirst fades. My hunger to taste blood trickles back into my throat, suddenly ignorable. We were at Gaius Point, the lead sister calls out. Their eyes are narrowed at the brightness of the flame behind me. I do not move. I tell them simply, I know. We have petitioned the Inquisition for your chapter's destruction, flesh terror. I know. That is all you have to say for yourself, heretic. After Gaius Point, after killing the squad of our sister Amelie de Vrain, after massacring an entire village. You came to pass judgment, I tell her. So do it. We came to defend this colony against your wretched blasphemy. They still fear me. Even outnumbered and armed only with a shattered axe, they still fear me. I can smell it in their sweat, hear it in their voices and see it in their wide eyes that reflect the flames. I look over my shoulder, where Jarl's legacy burns. Motes of amber fire sail up from the blaze, my brother's funeral pyre, and a testament to what we have all become, a monument to how far we have fallen. We burn our dead on Cretacea, because so many are killed by poisons and beasts and the predator king reptiles. It is a mark of honour to die and be burned rather than be taken by the forest. It was never meant to be like this. Not here, and not at Gaius Point. Twenty bolters open fire before I can look back. I don't hear them. I don't feel the wet, knifing pain of destruction. All I hear is the roar of a Cretacean Predator King, the Fury, rising from its reptilian jaws as it stalks the jungle of my homeworld. A carnosaur, black, scaled and huge, roaring up to the clear, clean sky. It hunts me. It hunts me now as it hunted me so long ago, at the start of this second life. I reach for my spear, and... Zavian clutches the weapon against his chest. It is death itself. He grunts to his tribal brothers as they crouch in the undergrowth. The tongue of Cretacea is simple and plain, little more than the rudiments of true language. The king lizard is death itself. It comes for us. The carnosaur shakes the ground with another slow step closer. It breathes in short sniffs, mouth open, jaw slack, tasting the air for scents. A grey tongue the size of a man quivers in its maw. The spear in its steady grip is the one he made himself. A long shaft of dark wood with a fire-blackened point. He has used it for three years now, since his tenth winter, to hunt for his tribe. He does not hunt for his tribe today. Today, as the sun burns down and bakes their backs, he hunts because the gods are in the jungle, and they are watching. The tribes have seen the gods in their armour of red metal and black stone, always in the shadows, watching the hunting parties as they stalk their prey. 
If a hunter wishes to dwell in paradise among the stars, he must hunt well when the gods walk the jungles. Zavian stares at the towering lizard beast. Unable to look away from its watery, slitted red eye, he shifts his grip on the spear he crafted. With a prayer that the gods are bearing witness to his courage, he throws the weapon with a heartfelt scream. The flesh terror crashed to the bloodstained ground, face down in the dust. Cease fire! Sister Superior Mercy Astoran said softly. Her voice obeyed immediately. But he still lives, one of them replied. This was true. The warrior was dragging himself with gut-wrenching slowness, one armed and with a trembling hand through the dirt. A dark trail of broken armour and leaking lifeblood pooled around him. He raised his shaking hand once more, dug the spasming fingers into the ground and dragged himself another half metre closer to the burning church's front door. Is he seeking to escape? One of the youngest sisters asked, unwilling to admit her admiration for the heretic's endurance. One arm lost at the elbow, both legs destroyed from the knees down and his armour a cracked mess that leaked coolant fluids and rich red Astartes blood. It is hardly escaped to crawl into a burning building, another laughed. He wishes to die among the blasphemies he caused, Astoran said, her scowl even harsher in the firelight. End him! A single gunshot rang out from the battle line. Zavian's fingers stopped trembling. His reaching hand fell into the dust. His eyes, which had first opened to see the clear skies of a distant world, closed at last. What should we do with the body? Sister Mercy Astran asked her commander. Let the echoes of this heresy remain as an example, at least until the Greenskins take control of the surrounding wastelands. Come, sisters, we do not have much time. Leave this wretch... For the vultures. Thanks very much for watching everybody. I would pick another book with loads of women in it. I need to just look ahead a bit more. I read this years ago but I forgot there was that much Sisters of Battle action in it. Sorry. So yeah, you've got a, a plethora of my girly voices there for you to enjoy. <laughs> I'll, I'll avoid that in future. As I always try to do but they keep popping up. All right, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for watching. Uh, I've mentioned on the channel, I put a channel update in. I've just moved house. Uh, I'm still waiting for an internet connection, so uploads might be a bit ropey for the next couple of weeks. But uh, I'll try and get things out anyway. Just it's not going to be as regular for a week or two or three. But thank you, everybody, for your support. You can see all your names here. There's a couple of new people being added, and thank you guys for that. Really appreciate it. It's a great help and I really appreciate it, lads. It's, it's fantastic. I will be back again with more very, very soon. Uh, so keep an eye out and let me know in the comments below what you think. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. I will see you next time. Have a great week. Have a great year. We'll be back soon. Cheers. Bye.